have the pleasure to have uh, Jaren with us today. He's, uh, he's going to maybe not talk about the kind of smart we have been seeing till now, but more about the governance for urban resilience and sustainability, who are the two other performance dimensions we look at. And he will uh, present different case studies from Asia, so you have different insights as well, not just Korea. So thank you very much, Jaren, yes. for coming, and uh, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you. Um, I shall very briefly introduce myself before I get into this uh, presentation and sort of set the scene and frame it a bit more in, in the broader point that you have here. So, yeah, my name is Jeroen, that's how you pronounce it in the Netherlands, or Jeroen, how you now, how I now pronounce it in Australia. So I'm from the Netherlands originally, but I moved to Australia about five years ago. Uh, I'm an associate professor with the Australian University, but also have a position in the Netherlands at the University of Amsterdam. Um, for the last decade or so, I've been very interested in the question, how can we make the transition from today's sort of unsustainable, highly energy, highly resource intensive, high carbon intensive cities to more sustainable cities, more resilient cities. And I will explain why uh, what is later on. Um, and one of the things that I'm specifically interested in is the politics of the governance around sustainability and resilience. And that's what I'm talking about indeed today. Now, how does that relate to smart cities? Um, the previous presenter already said smart, a smart city is part of, say, smart government or smart governance. Um, governance is even a broader concept. Um, and what I will talk about today mostly is sort of the transition that we've seen going on over the last three to four years from very much top-down government, where government used to tell how society was supposed to operate, to a society that's more understood as a governance society, in which governments work together with businesses and citizens. So that's where, um, that's where this um, broad presentation um, sits. So what I'll do during the next sort of hour and a half, uh, oh, sorry, next hour, I, I have to five, do I to five? Yeah, if we can do to five, so we have at least 30 minutes. For Excellent, time. yes. So sort of for the, for the next hour, I'll be talking about sort of the move to what I call governance innovation. So why is it so important that we've shifted from traditional top-down government to all kinds of um, governance innovations? I will then talk a lot about examples that I've studied over the last decade around the globe. Uh, present some of my key findings um, and so to give that away already what, what I've found over the last um, 10 years is that lots and lots of cities around the world are experimenting with all kinds of new governance initiatives the e-waste initiative that the previous presenter was talking about the you know involving citizens in cleaning up around their sort of fire uh, extinguish the in front of that house. And what I see is that it results in a lot of good practice, but it doesn't really generate the change at the time scale and at the um, sort of um, implementation scale that we need. So there is this big problem of skill and speed when you talk about governance innovation. Yes, a lot of good examples, but then they hit a wall and don't really sort of transform society. So how can we transform society is um, what I will end with. <coughs> So let's uh, look some 4,000 years back and, and look at cities and how they were sort of governed. Um, the first cities were, of course, developed in ancient Mesopotamia. So that's sort of where some of you are from, roughly. Um, and why did cities develop? Well, people came together, started to trade. And what do you need when you start trading? You need certainty, you need security. How do you create certainty and security? Basically by telling each other how you're going to deal with each other. So, Hammurabi, um, some 4,000 years ago, developed um, a set of codes about how society was supposed to work and how people were supposed to act. And his set of codes is one of the first sort of preserved codes in the world. So codes are probably sort of regulation, Governmental regulation probably goes back much more than 4,000 years, but his codes are um, one of the oldest that are still around, that, are sort of, that have been preserved. And specifically, city planners and people involved in building designs and, uh, and architecture always like this example 
because of quote 229, Hammurabi had a very clear understanding of how you could ensure that people would build safe buildings. Now, resilience is, of course, all about safety. And sustainability, in a certain way, as well. So Hammurabi said, well, if a builder builds a house that is not really safe and falls down and kills its owner, then the easiest way to solve the problem is to kill the builder. You know, if the builder is killed when he builds a non-sort of compliant house, then most likely he will, um, he will build a safe house. And this is a very interesting example, but if you sort of think at it, um, this is a way how cities and buildings in particular and infrastructure have been regulated for a very, very long time. What they call top-down mandatory regulation. Government tells you what to do, and government tells you what will happen if you don't comply with regulations. A door should be this high to be safe, a building should be this energy efficient to be sustainable, and so on and so forth. Now, what are sort of the Pros, what are the advantages of this top-down traditional um, governing? Well, to begin, it is a way to address societal risks. It is a way to you know, agree with each other about what is a safe building, what is a safe city, what is a healthy city, what is, a, what is an efficient city. And it makes it very clear for people in the market about what they are uh, about to do. At the same time, it helps to address what have become known as market failures. Do we know what market failures are? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, roughly. So, okay, I, I see some yeses and some noes. So one of the biggest issues in uh, developing a city, for the course that we're talking about here, and if you thinking about climate change and sort of causes of climate change, one of the major issues when you have a city is that we produce a lot of carbon emissions with each other. The carbon emissions that I produce might affect you or your country. The carbon emissions that Australia produces by exporting coal to India affect the world as, as a whole. Now, who's responsible for that? Who's going to address that issue? Is it Australia? Is it me, as an Australian citizen? Do I say, well, I mean, you know, people in India import our coal, so it is their responsibility? So, this is what has become known as negative externalities. So the problem that specific results of development cannot be traced directly to specific individuals or specific countries. And markets are very poor in solving these issues. So there's a lot of market failures that you can sort of address by saying, well, from here on, we're going to do it in such a way government do this. Already touched on this one. For the market in itself, so starting to thinking about smart cities, um, for markets, for businesses, for developers, it is very important to know what government is going to demand and what government is going to accept. If you're a property developer, or if you're a, you know, if you're in in, in, uh, in specific uh, IT uh, technology, you basically want to know what government is going to allow in five, ten, twenty years from now, because you want to invest. So if I'm a property developer and I buy specific materials to build buildings or specific you know, machines to build my buildings, I do want to know that I can use that for long enough so that I can you know, get my investment on my, that I can get a return on my investment. So traditional governance, um, lots of clarity and security for the market to be done. And sort of a last um, reason why many scholars sort of political scientists, uh, but also legal scholars, pretty often say, well, you know, the traditional force of law, traditional top-down regulation, very important because you treat like cases alike. It's, of course, good to know that if I want to build a building, and somebody else wants to build a building, that those two are treated in the same way, that I have to comply with the same regulations as you all, and that you all have to comply with the same regulations as I do. Because otherwise, government might treat some people in a better way than other people for certain reasons. So we do have, you know, we do have those quotes that I was talking about just before, those regulation building codes, planning legislation traditionally, to make sure that like cases are treated alike. So this is in a nutshell why for such a long time we've had 
top-down regulation for the development of cities and buildings. But of course, everything that comes with an advantage always comes with a disadvantage. So what are the downsides of this traditional government regulation? What are the downsides of top-down regulation? Well, to begin, it requires a lot of what has become known as institutional capital and capacity. So you can imagine that it will take a very long time and it take a lot, will take a lot of sort of people to think about what is a safe city exactly? How are we going to regulate a safe city? What is a healthy city exactly? What is a sustainable city exactly? Who's going to draw these rules? You know, I mean, look around here in Seoul, but um, I don't know if anybody of you has, has heard of Sejong City, which is the formal administrative capital of um, of Korea, and the whole city is just government buildings. The whole city is developed as a government, um, government as the administrative center of, of Korea. And literally thousands and thousands and thousands of government people work in Sejong City to develop regulation. It requires a lot of capital to develop regulations. At the same time, what is one of the big issues if you have regulation in place? You want to enforce it, you want to make sure that people comply with it. Because you know, having a rule in place is one thing, but of course people are not always going to comply with it. So somebody has to enforce this regulation. And specifically with cities and buildings, enforcement, traditional enforcement, is a very tricky issue. So what is the normal process of building a building? You apply for a building permit with your local government. You hand over some drawings that your architect designed. The local building administration is going to assess if your plan is complying with regulations. Then you start building. Once you're building, somebody from government comes and checks if your building work is, you know, being built according to plan. You start, you keep building, more people have to enforce this, then at a certain point you occupy the building, people have to come around again to check if everything is okay. So there's a lot of sort of interaction between government and building owners and city uh, users in how they comply and not comply with those regulations. So it's a very time and a very costly. It's one of the big problems. One of the other major problems with traditional building regulations, and this is going to be very interesting in the transition from current cities to smart cities, and I'm not talking about newly developed cities, but existing cities, how we're going to sort of, you know, smartize existing cities. I mean, building a new smart city, not too difficult. Retrofitting an existing city into becoming smart is going to be a hard one. Because one of the things that we are used to do is every time when we introduce new regulations, every time when we introduce new building codes, new planning legislation, we tend to grandfather existing buildings, existing infrastructure, existing cities from it. Now what does grandfathering mean? Nothing more than, oh, you already have this building, the, the existing building doesn't have to comply with the new regulations. And this is something that's going on around the world. Now why is this a problem? Look outside. Everything that you see has been built already. Everything that is around will most likely, whether you're in Korea, in Australia, in the Netherlands, in Colombia, in Mexico, in the United States, most likely everything that is currently in place will not have to comply with regulations that are going to be introduced tomorrow. Now we already know that by the year 2050, 75 of the percent of the buildings that are going to be used then have been built already. 75 percent of the buildings in the year 2050 have been built already now. So all the regulations that we're going to introduce over the next 20 plus years is not going to apply to those buildings. It's a big problem with traditional top-down regulation. So all the carbon emissions that are currently being produced by our cities today are not going to be addressed with top-down regulations of the way that we've used them for the last 4,000 years. That's a big problem. That's another one. And then sort of the final problem with traditional um, building regulations, traditional planning legislation, traditional sort of top-down governing is that we're so used to focus on objects, but Lots and lots of energy efficiency improvement, 
lots, lots and lots of carbon emission reductions are actually not being achieved through the objects, it's achieved through the way we use our buildings. So if I drive around in a car, I happen to have a car because I live in Australia and it's almost impossible to live in Australia without having a car. But if I drive around in my car, I consider it perfectly normal that there is a speed limit. You know, there's a speed limit of 50k an hour in the city, 80 on sort of on, on sort of local roads and 110 on the highways. And everybody considers that completely normal, and that is a behavior intervention. It's government telling me you're not allowed to speed, you know, over 50k an hour. Now in this room, how hot is it here? Or how cool is it in this room? 20? 22? Probably? Is this government telling us that it is 22? Is this government telling us that 22 is the right temperature? It's an interesting thing. We never ever think about government or some other governing body telling us, well, maybe 24 degrees in summer is cool enough. It is ridiculous, actually, that I'm a little bit cold right now. It's, what is, it's close to 30 degrees outside. It's 20-something in here. So I would almost have to wear a suit jacket indoors because we're wasting energy at this point. So traditional building regulation, traditional planning legislation, traditional top-down regulation doesn't focus on that big aspect of behavior. Any questions about that so far? So we see lots and lots of advantages of traditional regulation. It treats everybody the same, gives certainty and so on, and it comes with a lot of problems. So again, why is that so relevant? Well, we already know that cities are a key cause of all our carbon emissions and all our energy consumption. Do we know the numbers? 75, 75 to 80 percent. So if you look at climate change and the key causes of climate change, carbon emission uh, production, the numbers sort of studies show that 75 to 80 percent of all the carbon we produce is produced in cities. At the same time, we know, and this is something you have probably you know, talked about already, or we'll talk about it later on in the course, we have a lot of technology to reduce carbon emissions at city level. You can put solar panels on roofs to reduce energy consumption, you can switch off the heating, you can get the cooling here at the moment to reduce energy consumption, all kinds of technological and behavioral solutions to address this issue of carbon emission productions. But we seem to be very bad at using that. So currently already 75 to 80 percent of all our carbon emissions are produced in cities. And to make things worse, it's about 40 percent of all carbon and energy that we use around the globe is used by buildings and in buildings only. So if you want to make a big change in addressing climate change, it is at building level. Why is it so important for the building level? It is according to the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, exactly. It is the only sector in the world that we have, the only sort of economical sector that we have, where we can make a transition towards a more sustainable practice um, at net cost benefit. So if you look at agriculture, transport, it's probably going to cost a lot of money to make a transition towards lower carbon intensive production, lower carbon intensive transport. If you look at buildings and cities, we have the technology and we've had, had the technology for a long time already. This technology is widely available, solar cells, improved insulation, better glazing and so on and so forth, better building materials. This technology has been around for a long time, has been well trialed, it is cost effective already. So according to many sort of top um, government bodies around the world, the buildings, the building environment is the only area where we can really make a quick change because we have the technology, it's cost effective, it can be done. But still cities produce roughly 80% of the carbon. Another issue is that over the next 25 years roughly, over the next 25, 30 years, the world population will grow rapidly, but the urban world population will grow even faster. So the United Nations has an expectation that between the year 2010, between the years 2010 and 2050, again, there's the year again, the urban population will double. So 
if the population doubles, it basically means that we also need sort of double the size of our cities, or at least double the size of our built environment in cities. So if we already know that current cities and current buildings and current infrastructure and current way we use transport is very bad, and keeping in mind that this will double over the next sort of 20 to 30 years, the problem in 2050 will be enormous. So this is the sustainability aspect. Cities consume way too much energy, produce way too much power. At the same time, there is some evidence that under a changing climate, we will see many, many more extreme weather events popping up. Sea level might rise, might be going to rise. We will likely see drier summers, more rain in, um, in winter. Right now in Australia, we have very, very severe storms. Um, there was a big, big storm hitting Sydney over the last couple of days. Big trouble. The Netherlands, out of parts of the Netherlands, flooded uh, recently to, to a degree that has never happened before in recorded history. Um, more cyclones, most likely. Now, if a extreme weather event <coughs> hits a city, it will hit the place where most people live. So because cities are such concentrated places where people live, but also because cities are so important in our global world economy, you know, it's a place where we sort of produce most capital. If we will see more climate change related weather events, and if these hit cities, then that is the place where they will hit hardest. So cities are pretty often considered a cause and a victim of climate change. And that's might be interesting to keep it in the back of your minds is that we tend to look at cities, or for a long time people have tend to look at cities as sort of, you know, being the bad one, the bad guy. But if you want to generate change with your local government, starting to think about the risks that cities run under a changing climate might also be a very good reason to act. So cities sort of both cause and victim to, um, to climate change. Um, and that's where sort of all those you know, dual words always come in, resilience and sustainability. So cities have to reduce their carbon emissions, reduce their energy consumption, so that's sort of the sustainability side, but at the same time have to become more resilient to climate change. Now, the usual answer we get here is that governments say, and that academics like me say, and that people in business say, it's all about governance. That traditional top-down regulatory interventions, that's no good. You know, look at all the trouble that governments cause, it's too big, it's too sloppy, it's too expensive, blah blah blah, you know that the narrative. But then people in government say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Trusting the market, you know, giving handing this over to the market, handing climate change issues, handing urban sustainability and resilience, handing it over to the market is probably also not a good answer. Look at sort of all the problems that we've seen happening over the last five years, you know, as a result of privatization and um, government outsourcing. So many people think that the global financial crisis is one of the, one of the causes of the global financial crisis, but you often consider it to be a lack of government oversight. So, so sort of in the two extreme camps, people say, well, government is not going to be the answer, and the market is not going to be the answer. So maybe, maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle. And I'm a regulatory scholar, so I study regulation and governance. And if you sort of read up the literature around regulation and governance, then you see that this is sort of happening all the time. Pretty often people talk about the pendulum that's swinging between government and market. And it's swinging. So in the 1960s, we sort of witnessed a swing towards privatization, deregulation, marketization, and then we hit the global financial crisis, and suddenly people are calling for more governments again, stronger governments again. So we see a bit of a swing back right now. But that in-between area between markets and um, and government, or just right around, that is sort of where governance happens. Now, what is governance? It's a very sort of big container word. And if you read the literature on governance, there is no clear definition. And I really hope that somebody is going to give you, and I really hope that you will get a lot of definitions. This is a really one. What I normally do with my classes is I ask them to draw a Venn diagram. You know what a Venn diagram is? No, good. 
So a Venn diagram basically says, well, what is governance? Let's see, who's this? Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? Just a quick one, just a quick one, just, just come over here, just come over here. Come here? Yeah, just, just, let's, let's just do this one. Because this is, this is a really interesting, this is a really interesting sort of exercise around, um, around definitions. We, we pretty often tend to think that words are very clearly defined, but the word governance is not. Okay, let's say this is law. Now I'm going to ask you, if you think about all the regulation in the world, how would, you, how would that relate to law? If you have to draw another circle, how would it relate to law? All the regulations that we have in the world. Would it sit inside or outside? Yeah, well, just, 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 just draw. Like, uh, what, in the circle? No, whatever. I mean, what, what, what is sort of, what is your, your thought about? Well, we have got law. Okay. I've just talked about regulations. Yeah. Yeah. You you just, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another interesting example. Yep. Like this one too. Okay, I like this one, I like this one, okay. So, let's say, traditionally people would say <coughs> this would sort of be um, what a government does. Now, that's right, right. I'm, I'm going to pick over, but people can take over here. So, traditionally people would say, well, government does a lot of things, including making laws. The interesting thing is that over the last sort of 20 years, scholars academics, practitioners, and business people have become really interested in this area, and we already heard that in the previous, previous um, presentation. So what is happening between citizens and government? So one of the big trends that has happened over the last 20 years in governing is that governments have become open to what they call non-state actors. So citizens are becoming involved in governing, businesses are becoming involved in governing, um, with the assumption that it makes governance much better. What about the assumption in your <coughs> Another thing that we've seen happening a lot over the last 20, 30 years, which is important to sort of understand and think about where governance is going in the future, is where we would traditionally regulate and govern through negative incentives, so fines. You know, if I speed, I get a fine. If I build a building that doesn't comply, I get a fine. Back in the days of Hammurabi, you would be you know, killed. Um, but governing and lots of scholars and, uh, and, and policy makers and practitioners over the last 20 years have become to question negative incentives and fines. Now, why would you not want to fine people? Why would you think that fines might not work in achieving compliance? That sort of goes back to those negative aspects that I was talking about before, but sort of the cons of, of, of traditional government. So one, one thing is that if you always govern by negative incentives, it means that I always have to assess whether or not you comply. So I have to collect, the I government, uh, in this case, have to assess whether or not you, my class, is complying with the regulations. It's very costly for me. Another thing is that if I try to regulate you and if I try to make you comply because of negative incentives, then there is a chance, and this is something that happens a lot with building regulation, is that you only will go for the lowest, re lowest set of requirements. So if I tell you, you have to cut down your energy consumption to say 240 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, then that's what you will do. If I reward you for doing better, you might, you know, you might sort of move beyond the bottom line. Um, but those are sort of two big, big reasons why people say, well, those negative incentives don't really work. Another big thing that we've seen happening is that governments are relying more and more and more on self-organization, networks, people sort of looking after themselves. We already touched on that one. And the final reason is that and um, scholars say, well, you really need local solutions for local problems. And this is where cities are going to come. So cities nowadays pretty often have in place governance arrangements that are much more ambitious than what is happening at nation-state at nation level. Or that have in place governance arrangements 
you know, in really addressing local circumstances. Again, with the assumption that it will make things all the much better. So people talk about, well, governance is necessary to increase, to increase um, effectiveness. It will make the transition towards sustainable cities um, more effective or more efficient. If we can use the knowledge, because this is then sort of how the argument goes, if we can use the knowledge of local firms and local actors and local citizens, then it's more likely that they will create innovative, effective tools than what we could ever do as a distant bureaucrat. Other reason why people talk so much about governance is that supposedly it is going to increase transparency, accountability, and legitimacy. So if you include citizens in policy making, if you include firms, this is the argument, if you include them in policy making, in policy implementation, then they have a better insight in what is happening. And we already talked about it in the previous, at the end of the previous talk. If people can look at sort of the data that government collects, and if people can look at how governments make decisions, then they can also be a bit more critical. Um, and the final reason that people say, well, this, this move to governance is necessary because it will increase compliance with uh, tools that are in place, regulation that is in place. Because we have developed these new governance tools together with the people that we govern, so they might feel responsible for the outcome, or we give them positive incentives to comply instead of negative incentives. So it will likely increase compliance. And this list is what you will see in one form or the other in each and every World Bank report about governance, United Nations report about governance, about uh, C40 cities report about governance. Everybody is always talking about how great governance is going to be once implemented. The big problem, so that's all good, the big problem, I like to argue, is that governance so far has been much more theorized than studied and purity. And with that I mean is that everybody seems to repeat each other about the advantages of governance. We do not have a lot of evidence that these new forms of governance work so much better than the traditional top-down forms of governance or market based approaches. And that is exactly sort of where I like to come in with my work. We have very limited insight in whether, where, why, how, and to what extent governance, innovation, improve urban sustainability and resilience. So over the last five years, I was involved in a major research project in which I studied 60 examples of governance innovations for more sustainable and resilient cities. That's what we're going to look at. And the big question that I asked, do these governance innovations indeed result in a transition, in a fast transition to a more sustainable cities? Let's have a look at it. So, I studied 60 examples of governance innovations, and I will talk about the different types that I studied sort of over the next couple of minutes. I studied 60 examples in, of course, Australia and the Netherlands, because I hold positions in both countries in the United States, India, Malaysia, and Singapore. So it's a bit of a mix and match of traditional developed economies and, and rapidly developing economies. And if I look at those 60 examples that I've studied, I can see three main types. And all these governance innovations seek to improve the sustainability and resilience but in a way that is not sort of the traditional top-down government telling us what to do kind of way. So one of, the, um, one of the types of examples that I've studied is what has become known as certification and classification programs. So you can imagine that you're a builder and you want to build a building that is more sustainable than what government requires, but how can you market it? Or maybe you're a consumer and you want to live in a building or you want to occupy, you want to rent a building that's more sustainable than what government demands, but how can you really know that the building you're being offered is much better than what government demands? And this is sort of an issue where consumers and producers have an information problem. So it's information asymmetry where the producer always knows much more about the building than the consumer will have in and certification and classification programs come in exactly here. 
So pretty often, it's, a, it's an instrument where businesses develop their own set of regulations, and if you comply with that regulation, your building gets a seal of approval. We'll talk about it a bit more in, in a moment. But one of the examples you might know is that a lot of, um, a lot of coffee is certified organic these days. You might have seen that in, in your own countries. So if you buy food products, pretty often they are certified organic or certified child labor free or certified whatever, certified halal. Um, pretty often there is no government regulation in place that tells you that your product has to be organic or child labor free or halal. Producers might want to produce these goods and then can use these labeling programs to tell the consumers that indeed my product needs to be found. We talk about that a bit more later on. Another main type of um, governance innovations that I've seen sort of popping up around the world is what have become known as action networks. So governments are pretty often very aware that within their jurisdiction, lots of people want to accelerate the transition towards more sustainable cities, want to accelerate that transition towards more sustainable, sorry, more resilient cities. But how can you get that knowledge from these people? And what do you need to give these people, these organizations? What, what kind of incentives do we need to have in place to, um, you know, to work with them? Sort of another uh, type. I will, I will talk more about all the types uh, after I quickly introduce them here. And sort of the final type, and this is a really interesting one, um, what I've seen sort of in those 60 examples, are all kinds of innovative forms of financing. So pretty often if a property developer wants to build a building that is more sustainable or more resilient than what is required by uh, government regulation, they hit this wall of financing. So banks and finance suppliers pretty often couldn't care less about sustainability. They just want a business case. So they look at the building design, they see that sustainable building a sustainable building design is slightly more expensive than a traditional building design, and then question why do you want to build it? And then, of course, a developer says all of it is going to result in energy uh, efficiency, and people therefore have to pay lower bills, but a bank doesn't work that way. It compares two cases, um, doesn't want to finance it. So, in a nutshell, sort of the, the different types. Um, certification seeks to address a market issue, Action Networks tries to get that knowledge from people and innovative forms of financing. I'm going to jump through all the types now with many, many examples, which will be a roller coaster of examples, so maybe it's good to have a five-minute break. Is that what you normally do? Halfway lecture, or shall we just keep going? What, 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 what do you want? Do you want to keep going? Because it's sort of... Keep going. Keep going? All righty, then we just... Then we just so wake up. <laughs> Because we're going into a roller coaster now. Alrighty. Certification classification. It's absolutely the most popular governance innovation that you see right now around the world. There is no country. Sorry? Yes, I will I will go through. So in the 1990s, the BRE, which is an acronym in itself, the BRE uh, environmental assessment method in the United Kingdom was introduced exactly for the issue that I was just talking about. You had certain building producers that wanted to develop buildings that were more sustainable than traditional buildings, than what government requires. You had people who wanted to occupy, wanted to own buildings that were more sustainable than what government required. There was no way to assess or to evidence that these buildings they offered were indeed more sustainable. So Brigham came in in the 1990s, early 1990s, and developed a certification regime. And a certification regime is nothing more than a set of regulations set up by specific organizations that you as a builder can comply with. If you comply, you might get a Brigham seal. The United States Green Building Council has introduced LEED, Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design, very big certification program as well. The Building Code Authority in Singapore has introduced Greenmark. The Green Building Council in Malaysia has introduced the Green Building Index. Um, 
Terry, the Energy and Research Institute in India has introduced Rehai. Unfortunately, I don't know. I, I know what the acronym stands for, but this Indian, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. But basically, it's about healthy and sustainable living. But their competitors, the Indian Green Building Council, have introduced their own uh, certification scheme. So if you sort of look around the world, if, you sort of, if you're really interested in sustainable city design, sustainable city development, sustainable city transformations, you will no doubt hit certification and classification tools. Now, who are the people involved? Because it's a really interesting um, governance and innovation. Who are the people involved? Pretty often, businesses in a country, and also here in Korea, I had an interview this morning with the Korean Green Building Council, actually. Um, industry bodies come together pretty often to set up what becomes known later on as a Green Building Council. So it's a, it's a top industry representative body of um, material producers, of developers, of architects, of engineers that want to do something in the area of urban sustainability. They realize that there is a market for people who want to pay additional money for sustainable buildings, but there is no way of sort of um, advancing a specific building to meet specific requirements. So the Green Building Council has launched and introduces one of these tools. Um, that's sort of one, one part. In other countries, you see that these things are organized and set up by research institutes, so it's more driven by academics. Other actors involved, and that's for instance the case with uh, the BCA in Griha, are governments, and that's pretty often very interesting. So governments have in place their traditional mandatory requirements, but also want to introduce a marketing tool for sustainable building development. With so many actors in place, it is very important that if you study, if you, you know, if you look at these um, certification and classification tools, if you try to understand why specific actors have introduced a tool like this, because governments might have a whole different reason to introduce a certification tool than have businesses. And what you see happening all around the world is that we now have so many of these certification and classification instruments that it is very difficult for a consumer to understand the difference between leave and breathe.